to be a recording. Okay, if we could turn, please, in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, and it's a delight to be with you and share with you from God's Word. I want to read the first 14 verses, although we may get further than that in our time together, but uh, just for reading purposes, I'm reading from the King James Version, so hopefully you'll be able to follow along. Verse 1, it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord." walk as children of light for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth proving what is acceptable unto the lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light for whatsoever doth make manifest is light wherefore he saith awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and christ shall give thee light god will bless that reading of his precious words to us this evening uh, many years ago uh, somebody gave me a little booklet uh, by a man called watchman knee and it was called Sit, Walk, Stand. And it was kind of an overview of the epistle to the Ephesians. And I found it to be very, very helpful because the opening chapters, it really talks about our position in Christ. And what is our position in Christ? Well, we're seated in heavenly places. So that's the aspect of sitting. Uh, we're, uh, we need to enjoy sitting in our position in heavenly places in Christ. And then the next section, uh, which would be chapters four all the way through chapter um, uh, five, uh, uh, sorry, six, verse nine, uh, from four down to chapter six, verse nine, would be uh, the, the aspect of walk. And it's uh, our life in this world, walking before men as a testimony to the Lord Jesus. So we're seated in the heavenlies, we're walking in this world, and then the last section is stand, and it's our attitude towards the enemy. We're to stand against the enemy in the, the evil day or the day of temptation or trial. And so sit, walk, and stand. And the section that we're dealing with is the idea of walk. And uh, we're told back in chapter 4, and you've already covered it, but in chapter 4, verse 17, we're told that this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth or from now on, now that you're new creatures in Christ, now you're seated in heavenly places, it says, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity or, or foolishness of their minds. Do not walk like the Gentiles. We used to do that back in chapter 2, verse 2. It says, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. And so we used to walk like that, but now we're new creatures. And part of being a new creature in Christ is we have a new walk. And how are we to walk? Well, that's what this section is really dealing with. We're to walk, he says in chapter 5, verse 1, be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love. Not to walk as other Gentiles walk, not to mimic them or their behavior, but instead we're to be followers, mimics, imitators of God, be followers of God as dear children. You see, uh, we're now a new man in Christ, chapter 4, verse 24, and it says you put on the new man, and notice what it says, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So this new man 
which is created after God, we take his character. We're now partakers, as, it, as Peter would say, of the divine nature. And so the idea is this, that, that we're to, often you'll see the children in a family and you'll see them carrying the characteristics of their parents. And uh, I, I know for my, my own father, uh, my others would say that I, I actually walk like he used to walk. I, I, I look like him in many ways. Now, of course, he's passed now. Uh, but, but people would say, I, I just look like my dad. Well, uh, that's often the case, isn't it? We often bear the characteristics of our parents, our father and our mother. Now, sometimes that's a good thing, <laughs> uh, especially if uh, our parents have an integrity about them. Uh, but sometimes it can be a bad thing and it can be an embarrassing thing when you see yourself in your children and you don't like what you see. But remember that our father now is the father in heaven. And so we're to have a reflection of our father. Be therefore followers or imitators or mimics of God as dear children. We should have something of the family characteristics that remind the world of the father in heaven so how are we to do this how are we to imitate god well first of all we know that god is love we know that's a that's a true statement first john 4 8 tells us god is love and so he says here in verse 2 and walk in love <laughs> and so if we're to imitate god uh, we're to walk in love because god is love also we know god is light again first john 1 verse 5 god is light and in him is no darkness at all and so again in ephesians uh, chapter 5 verse 8 it says for you were sometimes darkness but now are you light in the lord walk as children of light so we're to walk in love we're to walk as children of light because god is light and then we also know that god is all wise don't we he's the all wise god and so if you look at verse 17, it says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So we're to reflect God in these three areas, walking in love, walking as children of light, and walking wisely. And so these are things that should be seen in our lives that show that characteristic of our imitating God being like him. Now, notice in verse one, he says, be ye therefore. And whenever you see the word therefore, it's always referring to something that has gone before. And so he says, we're to be followers of God. And one way particularly we're to be followers of God is in the area of forgiving one another. Notice chapter four, verse 32. It says, be kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And one of the ideas of our walking is we're in a new family now. We're in the family of God. And of course, in families, oftentimes there can be a little bit of rivalry and a bit of friction and, and you know, sibling rivalry and all that kind of thing. And of course, it's easy to get hurt in a family. A lot of people have been hurt by family members and so he says if we're going to imitate god one of the things about family life is that there are difficulties there are there are hurts there uh, sometimes uh, siblings do things to us that we don't enjoy and we don't like and if we're to be like god one of the things we have to do is forgive one another even as god for christ's sake hath forgiven you and i find it a very challenging thing because um, how, we, how much has God, for Christ's sake, forgiven you? you? You can hardly begin to calculate the extent of your forgiveness. And yet sometimes in assembly life, somebody does something to me 25 years ago, and I can't get over it. And that is so grieving to the Holy Spirit. And it is so unlike God, who has forgiven us all trespasses because of the work of Christ. And we seem to struggle to forgive one another for the slightest offense. And so he said, if we're going to really walk the way we should walk, we need to imitate God. And one of the ways we need to imitate God 
is forgiving one another, not bearing grudges, not holding hurts, not uh, keeping uh, this, uh, these offenses uh, so that uh, we can't get on together in the family. It's very important that uh, we show love one towards another and particularly in the area of forgiveness. And so he says in verse two, walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. And his love towards us wasn't just a professed love. Uh, sometimes people will say to another person, oh, I really love you. And it's just words. It hasn't. It, it really is just words that we've had people say that to us, and yet they don't want to spend any time with us. They don't seem to want to be around us. And I'm thinking, well, why would you say you love us if you don't want anything to do with us? It's just words. It's just empty words. But when he says walk in love, and he gives us the example, as Christ also hath loved us. Well, he didn't love us just in word, did he? In fact, uh, he he wasn't just a professed love but it was a clearly expressed love. How did he express that love for us? Well, it says he gave himself for us. It was a sacrificial love. He gave himself for us. Oh yeah, we know that Christ loved us because he went to Calvary for us. Uh, his love was demonstrated. It wasn't just in word. It was shown in a marvelous way. He has given himself. It was self-sacrificing. And true biblical love means going the extra mile. It means that self-sacrificing love. It means not just saying words, but demonstrating it in our relationship with one another. He gave himself. And, and who was it for? For us. Isn't that marvelous? He gave himself for us. That was the extent of his love. It was in the interest of others. It was not self-centered in any way. It was in the interest of others. And then it says, he gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God, and therefore he gave himself, it was for the glory of God. That was the purpose. It was a sacrifice for God. And the end result was a sweet-smelling savor ascended to heaven because of Christ's sacrifice. An offering speaks of the voluntary nature. You know, in the book of Leviticus, you have the sweet savor offerings, and they're in Leviticus chapters one through three. And what makes them these sweet savor offerings is that they were voluntary. They weren't compulsory. And the Lord Jesus giving himself for us was voluntary. Uh, he was the one in, in eternity past that said, here am I, send me. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was a voluntary offering. <clears throat> it was a sacrifice. <clears throat> it speaks of bloodshed. It was a sweet-smelling savor, just as those Old Testament sacrifices brought an aroma up to God, so Christ's death brought a great aroma into the presence of his Father. And so to walk in love <clears throat> for the children of God means forgiving one another, <clears throat> means uh, showing a great willingness to pay a personal cost in doing that, and, and also doing it for the glory of God. The motivation is for the glory of God. And that brings a sweet savor into his presence. But then we get to verse three, and we see this word, but. Now, whenever you see the word, but in the Bible, it's a contrast word. And the contrast is between the sweet savor of this sacrificial love and a stench of fleshly, lust <laughs> sacrificial love sweet savor fleshly lusts a stench that comes into the presence of god and so in contrast to that sweet smelling, smelling sacrifice is the the stench of immorality and sexual perversion what we call the flesh you see ephesus <clears throat> was a place where there was a, a temple that was very famous. It was to the goddess Diana. And uh, actually, uh, this uh, <clears throat> temple, uh, there was a, a meteorite that had fallen from heaven. And this meteorite was in the shape of a many-breasted woman. And so Diana became a fertility goddess. And so there was a lot of sexual immorality and greed and wickedness that was connected with the worship of Diana. 
And these people have been saved out of that background. And he's telling them now they're children, they're to walk differently. They're not to walk as they used to walk. They, they didn't, uh, they're to walk in love, sacrificially. But how did they used to walk? Well, he says, <clears throat> fornication, that's sexual immorality in its widest aspect, all kinds of sexual perversion, sexual immorality, and all uncleanness. Uh, again, it's impurity of every shape or form and covetousness. <clears throat> and that's that idea of, of lust for more. And it can be for things, but it can also be lust for more perversion. All of these things, he said, these are such a contrast to the sacrificial love that brings a sweet savor to God. And he says, let these things not be once named among you as becometh saints. But what he's saying is these things are utterly hateful to God, shouldn't even be named. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> shouldn't even be named among the saints. Shouldn't be part of our conversation. Uh, it shouldn't be part of our viewing habits. Uh, yeah, of course, in the days of television and all the rest of it, uh, because we're saints. Notice he says, uh, it's not fitting for saints. Saints are those that are set, set apart for God. Uh, we used to be involved in all that worship connected with Diana of the Ephesians. But now we're set apart for God. And so it's just not fitting uh, to dwell on this kind of stuff anymore that we once were so enamored with. Uh, verse 4, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. And so he goes on and, and talks about sins related to the tongue. Filthiness, that's the idea of obscene talk uh, and and sometimes you're around people i remember in the workplace in england and almost like everything a person said it was twisted and there was a sexual innuendo connected with it and they, they just seemed to make everything dirty and so filthiness this obscene talk uh, again connected with the heart really out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and so if a heart is caught up with this kind of stuff it'll turn everything into filthiness foolish talking, empty conversation that is worthy of, of, a, of an imbecile, a moron. Uh, it's just not fitting for the saints of God. Jesting, always joking, always turning every conversation into something light and trivial. You see, eternal things are very sober. They're very serious. And it's, it's, it's easy to make things light. I remember being in gospel meetings and a sobering message of heaven and hell given. And afterwards, some person, supposed professed believer, get up and says something light and trivial. And it's almost like the whole atmosphere is broken. Uh, the, the presence of God, it's almost like it's withdrawn because, uh, again, this, this empty talk is introduced that just is not fitting for those that are saints. Instead, what should be seen among saints is giving of thanks. Giving of thanks for what the Lord has done for us. For, for the great sacrificial love of the Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. Should be this attitude of gratitude amongst the saints for the great salvation that is ours. That should be what thrills our hearts more than anything else. And so he says in verse 5, For this ye know that no whoremongerer, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. The people that persistently and deliberately live in sin are not going to share in the kingdom of God. And they knew this. Notice he's, he's, he says, this you know. Uh, he, they'd been taught that. They'd been taught clearly from the very beginning that that kind of lifestyle uh, those kind of people that they, they don't inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, those that are involved in whoremongering, again, it's from that word pornos from which we get pornography, one who practices fornication or illicit sex, uncleanness, a morally dirty person, 
remember, we, we've been clean. We've been washed. Uh, we're clean through the work of Christ. Uh, the covetous man, uh, he, he, it's equated with idolatry, covetousness, which is idolatry. In other words, he's not satisfied with God and with Christ. He's made an idol out of stuff. Uh, and, and so this kind of person who is involved in these things, made a, made a God out of greed, made a God out of the accumulation of things. These kind of people, you know, do not inherit the kingdom of God. In fact, he says, let no one deceive you with vain words or empty words. It would seem that there were some that were teaching, it didn't matter how you lived. Uh, don't matter what kind of moral standards you have. You can live as you please. He said, don't allow these people to deceive you with empty words because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And immediately in my mind, when I think about for, for these things comes the wrath of God on the children of disobedience, it, it brings me back to Romans chapter one. Remember Romans chapter one, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth or suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And so he says, you know this, that this the wrath of God comes upon people that live that way. And, and notice um, there's a kind of a almost a flashback here to what they used to be because he, he talks about the wrath of God coming upon the children of disobedience. And if you go back to chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3, we have a description of what they were before conversion, before they came new creatures. Wherein in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Isn't that what he said here? Uh, in chapter 5, verse 6, the children of disobedience. And then verse 3, among whom also we had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were, were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So there's a clear parallel, isn't there, between Ephesians 2, verses 2 and 3, and chapter 5 and verse 6, where you've got children of disobedience and you have the wrath of God. That's what you used to be. That's how you used to live. But something happened. You were converted. You became new creatures. You now are walking a path of good works that are laid out from, for you from before the foundation of the, the world. This is what you used to be. And this is what will come upon those that are the children of disobedience. And so he says to them, be not, verse 7, ye therefore partakers with them. Believers are solemnly warned to have no part in such behavior. They're not to be part of that. It dishonors Christ. It ruins our testimony. It invites divine discipline. Don't be involved in these kind of things. And so stay away from, from that. Be, be separated from it. We're separated to God and we're separated from that kind of lifestyle that was so prevalent in the city of Ephesus. And so he says in verse 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Notice we said God is light. And he says, we were sometimes darkness. It doesn't say we were in the dark, but it says we were darkness. <laughs> Our hearts were very dark before we were converted. We were sometimes darkness, but now, and again, it's that lovely uh, uh, kind of transition word, but we used to be this, but we used to be darkness, but now, what are we? We're light in the Lord uh, because well, the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ has shined in our hearts. And so we're now light in the Lord. And therefore, he says, because of this, not only are we to walk in love, but he says we're to walk as children of light. 
first epistle of John, walk in the light as he is in the light, right? We're to walk in the light, walk in the light of the word of God, walk in the light of the countenance of God, walk with him day by day in the light, not in the darkness. Formerly, they were, they were darkness itself. Uh, they were very dark. Uh, remember back in chapter 4, verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. That's what we used to be. That's what the unsaved still are. But we are now light in the Lord. And so it says, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, in righteousness, in truth. See, we're as believers, when we got saved, we're now under new management. Something happened. <laughs> it used to be we were dominated by the self-life, but now we have a new boss. The Spirit of God took up residence in our lives, and the fruit of the Spirit, that dependence upon him, and we're going to have a lot more about the Spirit's work in this chapter, but is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. That's what the Spirit will produce. Goodness, it's love in action. Righteousness, a rightness of character before God. We're declared righteous, but there'll be a righteous life that will be produced by the Spirit of God, who is holy. We have the Holy Spirit within us. And then truth, integrity, and honesty will characterize those that are children of light, that are walking in the light, these are things that will characterize such a person, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And this is a great way to analyze matters that we face. Every day we face choices. And we need to ask really the acid test for any believer about any issue. Is this acceptable to the Lord? right? Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. You, you know the character of the Lord. Is this, is this going to please him? Is this acceptable to him? Is this compatible to the one who is light and in him is no darkness at all? And, and if it isn't compatible, then I, I'm to avoid it. I can't do that. I can't be involved in that. And so he, he emphasizes proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, putting things to the test and proving them with this criteria behind it. Is this going to be acceptable to the Lord if I do this? Or is this going to displease him? Is this contrary to light? Is this, is this darkness? Then I shouldn't be involved in it. In fact, it says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Uh, again, we're reminded about uh, in Second Corinthians about can these things be together? Second Corinthians six, uh, we, we know these verses well, uh, where uh, where we're told um, <clears throat> verse seventeen: Come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you and be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And so the idea is that we can't be involved in these things. Uh, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteous communion? What communion hath light with darkness? Verse 14. What fellowship has light with darkness? They're, they're mutually opposed to each other, right? They're, they're completely opposites. And so have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, rather reprove them. Now, how do we reprove the unfruitful works of darkness? How do we do that? What does it mean to reprove them? The word reprove has the idea of put to shame, expose, prove to be wrong. So we're not, not just to have no fellowship with darkness, but we're to expose it. Now, the best way to, to, to show darkness is light, <laughs> uh, right? Light exposes darkness all the time. And so the idea is that we're not supposed, it's not like we go around condemning people all the time, but, but our holy walk, walking in light, 
actually in itself it condemns darkness it it, it just just that light uh, in our walk exposes darkness and, and so part of it is how we live how we live does cause people to feel guilty because they know what's right and wrong and so we we need to make sure that we're walking in the light it, isn't it interesting that it uses the term unfruitful works of darkness and the idea is this that when there's darkness it's not conducive light is necessary for fruit bearing so i remember um, many years ago i can't remember the exact date but there had been a a big volcanic explosion in the in the us yeah, and uh, the the uh, the result of the the dark cloud that kind of seemed to hang over for a long time uh, the, no fruit trees bore any fruit because the sun was blocked with all the stuff that had come up from this volcano and so we recognize that you're going to have fruit you've got to have light right light is important for light and so the unfruitful works of darkness th there can be no fruit produced in darkness uh it, it it requires light and so he says <clears throat> we're to have no fruit fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but reprove them and again we do that primarily by our lives but there is a time to speak out against that which is evil as well but primarily it's by the walk walking as children of light that is what it reproves that's what exposes darkness and then he says, <clears throat> verse 12, and again, it's a bit of a repetition, verse 12 of verse 3. It says, um, it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. You remember verse 3? It says, things that are not supposed to be named among you as becometh saints. And so we've got to be very careful about what we talk about now we can talk about what the scripture talks about but we but but again even with soberness i mean these are sobering things it talks here about fornication uncleanness all of these things but but it doesn't go into graphic detail it just tells you about these things and it does it with a soberness but for the child of god it, it, these things should not be part of our conversation the things that they do in secret and again suggestive of darkness uh you know it's interesting that a lot of sin occurs in the night hours right in in shady parts of towns and 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 part of it is this idea of darkness doing things in secret there's a there's a shame and a secrecy about these things and and the things that we as saints should not be discussing or talking about and of course, today, part of the difficulty is with access to media, um, there's there's a lot of dirt being brought out <laughs> in the daylight, in a sense. Shouldn't be there, but it's there. And we have to be careful that our conversation does not, as it were, disintegrate into those kind of matters. So he says, but verse 13, but but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light but whatever doth make manifest is light. That's why I was saying about it reproves them. Light shows up darkness. Uh, so <clears throat> light in the natural world always exposes. And so as we walk as children of light, our very walk will expose darkness. Uh, you, you all know the, the story of the, the housewife that busily cleans her house and it looks very immaculate and then all of a sudden a shaft of sunlight comes through the window and what do you see <laughs> well you see dust particles everywhere don't you because what does light do it shows up dirt it always does it always does and so the idea is this that as we walk in the light and walk as children of light as we walk this way we will expose the darkness and we'll show it for what it is. All things are reproved that are made manifest by the light, but whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So just in a natural sense, light 
always exposes darkness. It always shows up dirt. And so, we're, again, he's encouraging us to walk as children of light. And so verse 14, as he brings this little section about walking in the light to a conclusion, he says, wherefore he saith. Now, whenever it says he saith, you've got to ask, where does he say it? In other words, it's a quotation that is in view. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And there's some debate as to what scripture uh, the apostle Paul had in mind, or was it a combination of scriptures? But I want us to go back to the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Isaiah 60 verse 1. And so many believe that that's the scripture that he has in mind. Arise, the idea of wake up, get up, you know, uh, shine. Uh, <clears throat> you that sleep, arise from the dead, for Christ shall give thee light. And that it's a, it's a paraphrase from Isaiah 60, verse 1. A Christian not actively walking in the light is compared to a person sleeping among the dead. Remember, the, the unsaved world are dead in their trespasses and sins. And so he's telling us, wake up. Don't be sleeping among the dead. Our inactivity and backslidden condition may cause us to be mistaken for the dead. <laughs> in other words, can people tell that I truly am a child of God by my walk? Is my walk in the light clear enough for them to see that I am actually different, not one of them. There's a difference. And so the spirit would counsel the person who's hard, even discernible as a child of God. Uh, he's not walking like he should in the light to wake up, awake. You're sleeping. You're, you're indifferent. The counsel of the spirit is awake and arise. And now the context in Isaiah 60 is speaking of, Israel's future millennial bliss. <laughs> Awake, rouse, stir oneself, stand up, and Christ will give thee light, speaking of the, the glory of the millennial kingdom. But now he's saying for us, stir yourselves from indifference and lethargy and stand up from among those that are spiritually dead and shine brightly for the Lord Jesus. Because as you do that, it will expose darkness. Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ will give thee light. Walk in love, as Christ also loved us. Walk as children of light. And now the final one in verses 15 through 17, we're to walk wisely. Because again, where family characteristics, God is love, walk in love. God is light, walk as children of light. God is all wise, walk wisely. So he says, and it's a bit like the book of Proverbs here, where wisdom is contrasted with folly, similar kind of idea to what you see in the book of Proverbs. He says, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So this is, uh, again, a yet further reference to walking in this epistle. And it's his fifth one, and last reference to the believer's walk. Solemn attention must be given to one's walk. The believer must not walk unwisely, not walk like a fool. The world... They're fools, right? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's how they walk. But we're to walk wisely, not as fools. We're not ignorant of the great eternal realities. So we're to walk wisely, intelligent to spiritual and eternal realities. 
And so we must pick our steps and guide our feet with great wisdom. And part of the way that we walk wisely, not as fools, is we redeem the time. A lot of people in the world, they waste time. They waste a lot of time, spend hours watching trivia. <laughs> uh, they, they're just constantly wasting time. He says, we don't have time to waste. Let's use the time for the Lord Jesus. Redeeming the time, buying up the opportunities. That's the idea. To redeem is to buy something, to purchase something. And so purchase up the opportunities. The days are evil. But we can, we can redeem evil days into good days. Life is short. It has often been said, only one life. It will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And so he says, we're to redeem the time. The days are evil. And then he says this, wherefore, okay, again, Application now, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Understanding, using our minds, right? It, you know, uh, Romans 12, be renewed in your mind uh, that you may know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so this is, I think, a daily admonition to us. Each day, we've got 24 hours before us. How can I buy up the time today and not use it in an unwise way? And so what I want to know is, Lord, what is your will for my life today? What do you have me to do today? Who do you want me to encourage? Who do you want me to testify to? Uh, how do you want me to use my, my activities this day? I want to buy back this day for you. I want it to be done uh, according to your will. What is your will for me today? Our lives as a whole are based on numerous daily choices. In other words, what I will be at the end of my life will be determined by the daily choices that I've made. It, am I choosing according to the will of God? Now, interesting, this last Saturday, we had a men's study at our assembly, men's breakfast in a study, and we were talking about the will of God. That was our topic and one of the things that we came up with is that the will of God is primarily moral. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. In everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Here, he talks about, understand what the will of the Lord is. In the very next verse, he says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And so what we can see is the will of God is not so much where I am, but it's what I am. Am I living a life that is well-pleasing to the Lord? Am I doing those things that will bring pleasure to the heart of God? And so moment by moment, I'm asking these things, these questions. Um, is this going to please you? Is this going to bring pleasure to your heart? Am I proving what is, verse 10, acceptable unto the Lord? A life which is wisely lived is a life that is lived to please the Lord. And of course, when we think of the Lord Jesus, no greater life. This is our closing statement. He said, I always do those things which please the Father. <laughs> he lived a wise life, a life pleasing to God. Are we walking in love? Are we walking as children of light? Are we walking wisely in this world? May God help us to think seriously about not only our position seated in heavenly places, but our walk in this world and ultimately about our warfare. Are we going to stand against the enemy? May God encourage us with these things. Amen.